Lynn. Um, I work at the moment, uh, just started working part-time now at the World Development Movement. I've been working there for a couple of years. And as well as that, I've started working part-time for agency More Onion. And um, so if you have any questions about More Onion during this presentation uh, or afterwards, then you can speak to the More Onion contingent at the back or me. And um, some of the, the kind of the, the uh, a few of the things I'm going to mention about in this presentation relate to the kind of the technology we've been using, which is engaging networks. So I think Jonathan's here, you can always talk to him. And also some of the kind of the uh, recruitment methods we were using was involving Care2 and Rhiannon's here as well from Care2. So all the people you might want to talk to about that kind of stuff, you can ask them rather than, rather than ask me about those kinds of things. So um, I'm kind of going to present a bit of a, a, bit of a case study of um, some work, uh, a bit of a strategy we, we worked on last year uh, at the World Development Movement uh, around recruiting new supporters uh, via our um, online campaigns and then um, taking those supporters on a bit of a, um, through a kind of a strategy of email communications around keeping those supporters engaged and then going on to hopefully um, encourage as many of those uh, new campaigners to become donors as well and predominantly online but finishing up with kind of a bit of a, a telemarketing program so some of those people who'd been the most engaged then went in through into telemarketing and were called to, to encourage them to become regular donors. Now that's something that WDM has been doing for a in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a sort of a, a bit of a way for, for a number of years now. Um, that's something that there's kind of a program, it was known as the kind of campaigner conversion program, which I always thought was a bit of a sinister name for it. Um, and it's been kind of a ongoing for, for several years, but this was the first year really that it kind of became a bit more of a really targeted and focused strategy to try and maximize the, um, the numbers in terms of recruitment, but also the numbers in terms of ongoing engagement with campaigns and also converting as many of those people to become uh, donors and more committed supporters in the long term. So, um, just quickly going to outline some of some of the very quickly I've mentioned already, but some of the goals. So, we wanted to recruit lots of new activists to our email list. So, get as more people on our email list, engaging with our work and engaging with our campaigns, but making sure they stay involved with those campaigns, and encourage some of those activists to then go and make one-off donations, and hopefully some of those to go on to become regular givers and. Um, so obviously a lot of our strategy included a lot of the typical buzzwords you might imagine. I'm going to try and avoid using as many of those as I can today, but there's a little bit of stewardship, lead generation, segmentation, etc. no doubt going to be in there. Um, so our strategy, something that I know um, other people have talked on, Rhiannon mentioned yesterday, uh, but others have mentioned as well about the importance of welcoming people. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our strategy around how we welcome people and get them first first involved in the organization and then finding out more about what we did um, and a bit more about the range of online actions that we offered people to really get them more engaged and more involved in the kind of uh, campaigns that we're running. And the really key part of what we did was the email communication strategy and the kind of the level of segmentation and data analysis and the testing and even some reactivation involved in there as well. And the different uh, ways we looked at trying to encourage as many one-off donations as possible online and then finishing up with a kind of telemarketing process. But what I'm not, I'm not going to kind of go through this in a kind of a, an order, if you like, a kind of this is what we did in January and then in February and then, then March. I'm going to try and t I'm going to pick out the five key things that we found worked and the five key things that we learned from the process last year and kind of go through those one by one and hopefully you'll kind of see a bit through, through exploring those kind of five key learning points. Uh, look through some of, the, some of the key things that we did throughout the course of the year. So the first, the very first kind of key lesson from us from all of this last year. Um, the key thing, that's a picture of our office uh, at WDM. Uh, any guesses as to what, what is in that picture that was one of the key reasons why this, this kind of program worked really well last year? Very good guess, yes. <laughs> Yeah, so we had, this is our email planning schedule, broken down by all the different uh, places that we recruited uh, new people to our email list from. So the first key thing for us was the segmentation of our email list as really kind of uh, detailed way as possible. So um, just moving back onto that slide there. The first line, for example, was our new recruits from... Um, that we recruited by working with Care2, for example. And so that kind of broke down um, the first welcome, the welcome emails that people were taking and then the follow-up action that those people would take and then the reminder email if people hadn't taken the action a week later, 
uh, thank you and ask people to share and so on and so forth. That was just for one stream of our, of our new recruits. This line was for people who've taken a particular action on Facebook and this one for a different action that people have come to us via Facebook, a whole series of tailored separate uh, communications around uh, the welcome series and the follow-up actions that people would take. Um, and we had a huge number of different, um, different groups. We ended up with about eight or nine different, different groups in the end over the course of the year. And one of the key lessons that we learned from that was um, that actually it was, it was really worth the time and effort to go through and just even make really minor changes to a lot of those those emails. It only needed just the, even the first paragraph changing for some of those emails. It really made a difference just to refer back to that very first action that someone had taken. Or for example, the people we recruited uh, with Care2, referring through the first six or seven emails that people received, that first paragraph of the email referring back to saying, oh, thanks for the, the action you took via, uh, with WDM via the Care2 website. So really re having that kind of flow and narrative that's really tailored to the, the way that someone's first engaged with the organization is something that we found really, uh, really important. This is just, just a quick example of how we did some of that segmentation. This is our Christmas fundraising appeal. Um, was to kind of really break down, um, it's just one example of, of um, across, our, across, across each of these segments, to try and um, encourage as many of those people to then make a donation. So, we, we would say, uh, we sent slightly different emails to all these groups of people. For example, people who'd never made a donation previously but had taken action on our food campaign, or people who'd never made a donation previously and never taken action on the food campaign. So we really tailored our emails accordingly to try and uh, make them as, as personalized and as relevant to each of those individuals as possible. Um, the second thing, though, following on from that, is that for this whole kind of process, email was really really crucial. Now I was really interested to see someone who put a uh, proposal for a, um, uh, an open space session later on, is email dead? Um, so uh, I, I, would, I would disagree with that. Uh, email was absolutely crucial for us as part of this process and having a really clear email communication strategy um, was important for a number of reasons. The first thing was testing. Testing via email is obviously really relatively easy and cheap, particularly compared with kind of offline fundraising, for example. So, um, you know, doing different, multiple different versions of, of offline appeals and really tailoring them can be expensive and costly, whereas doing that through email and online, very much cheaper or, or not necessarily any extra cost other than the time in doing that segmentation work. Um, so, yeah, we were able to send a lot of different versions of emails and multiple strands of our emails at no extra cost other than the time in producing and writing those emails. Um, we were also able to send a real range of of content to people as well, not just those actions and fundraising uh, type of emails, but report, being able to report back on things that we'd already done and send a mixture of different content, which I'll talk a bit more about in a second. Um, and automation as well. And I promise this is the last time I show you this diagram, but a lot of the emails in this, we were actually able to automate. So for example, the welcome emails uh, throughout each of these processes, these were automated so that every time someone came on and took, for example, uh, an action on the food campaign, that welcome email was, was fully automated, so they would get that um, uh, straight away four days, four days later, the second email, four days later, the third email, for example. So all of that process could be completely automated, and if we needed to make a change to something in one of those emails, we could change it, and it would, it would, it would go across all of those. So, so and, and another example of something we were able to automate was every time someone made the very first donation, six weeks later, we'd send them uh, an email uh, asking if they would like to make uh, to, to sign up to, a, to a, a direct debit. So that entirely automated process as well. So within the, those six weeks, uh, having that, that automated email to, to follow up with people um, saved a huge amount of time as well. And that's something that email is hugely important for. Um, some of the other uh, content that we used to send people was, we, we'd send people when we produced some other content. This was an example of an infographic we produced, for example, and we also sent people um, if we produced a video, or in this case, uh, it was a documentary that produced that range of content for people uh, to mix up the, the, the emails that we were sending them. So if people had clearly uh, arrived on our campaign about food, for example, we'd try and send them in a, in a mix of the emails. Um, uh, we'd send them some emails about other aspects of our food campaign or other aspects of our climate campaign as well. Um, and the other really important thing for email was um, reactivation. So I know I talked about this last year, and... I'm going to mention it again because I think it's really important because um, 
after six months of someone taking an action for the first time with WDM, if people hadn't taken a second action with us, we would send an email um, really to find out why and to try and re-engage and reactivate those people. And again, this is fully automated as well. So we would send a little survey to people last year. So um, just, just asking for their feedback on our emails, saying, I like your emails, please keep sending them. I don't have time to read your emails. Send me fewer emails, etc., etc. And over the course of last year, we sent those emails went to about 1,250 people. Uh, sorry, that's not true. They went to about 6,000 people, sorry. And 1,250 of those people who hadn't done a single action then went on to click and to respond to one of those um, surveys. And 750 of those 1,250 people have now done an action and 25 have donated. And those are people who could otherwise have been completely lost to WDM, who to taken an action and then just, just not engaged with our email subsequently. So by having that process in place to reactivate, re-engage those people, that's re regained 750 people and gained potentially 25 donors that we wouldn't have otherwise had. Um, and then using, uh, we wanted to keep people on our email list, so trying to send really interesting content, but also people are going to unsubscribe, sure, that's, that's inevitable. But what we tried to do was to encourage people to change their mind after they'd hit the unsubscribe button as well. So when people went uh, unsubscribed from our email list, they got taken to this page to thank them for, thank them for being on our email list. But we immediately gave them an option to change their mind and resubscribe just to some of our emails, just to get some campaign emails or just to get event emails. And we found 12.5% of people who hit the unsubscribe button immediately resubscribed to at least some <laughs> of our emails, which is really interesting. Now, I, I'm gonna, uh, an interesting story about this as well was that uh, our fundraisers were really initially reluctant to, to do this, surprisingly. They thought, oh, well, it's going to be really complicated. We're going to have people. We don't, want, we don't want to be just sending people campaign emails, though. People are going to unsubscribe from email lists. They'll just sign up to campaign emails. That's no use to us. It's crazy. So uh, it's really great that we got those people back on our email list because uh, every time someone heard about us, took a campaign action, which I'll mention a little bit more about in a second, every time someone took a campaign action, the thank you page after a campaign action is a donation form. So every time we re-engage people who otherwise might have unsubscribed and are just keeping engaged with our campaigns, as a campaigning organization, that's inevitably going to encourage people to donate. So uh, yeah, that was, uh, I'm glad I won that battle. <laughs> um, the third thing was having a, a real series of online actions, um, not just having, uh, having kind of one one, on, one action, two actions, and a long time period between them, trying to have a real kind of narrative and flow to the kind of campaigns and the actions that we were sending out. So over the course, um, over the course of last year, we also, well, I'll, I'll come back to this in a second as well, but producing some slightly tailored versions of our campaign action pages targeted at different audiences. But over the course of last year, we ended up having about 15 or 16 online campaign actions relating to, uh, to campaigns. And that really gave, gave as many ways and opportunities and different types of action to encourage people to get involved, to stay involved, and to, um, and to take part in those campaigns and keep involved with WDM. And I appreciate that's something that's easier to do um, at an organization like WDM that's really focused on campaigns. But it was really good to think a bit more creatively about having a range of actions. Some were more Twitter-focused, some were company-focused, some were more political focus, petitions, it's a good range of actions that could try and engage as many people in as many ways as possible across the campaign. Um, so uh, just a quick example of that, um, of one thing that we tried as well was having a, a real series of actions. So as part of our food campaign, we had this spoof uh, Bankers, Bankers Anonymous site, so it was a bit of a kind of help, help bankers who were addicted to gambling on food around commodity prices. So we, we had a series of five actions, the idea being that every two weeks, five actions, so over the course of ten weeks, eight weeks, people would get um, five campaign actions from us when they signed up to taking part in the, in the food campaign. So to really immediately get people really engaged and involved in the campaign and in the organization. And those, those actions actually went on to gradually get more, more tricky, so right into your local paper and then finishing up with one where you could find out if there are events going on in your local area and, and even join up with a local group. And obviously far fewer people did that, but what the advantage of that had was really introducing to people the whole range of different ways they could get involved in WDM. So it wasn't just about doing online actions, it was also doing about offline stuff and also about how, how they can get involved in local groups. So it really helped give that kind of overview of the whole organization. Um, and the other thing we did um, 
Now, this was a typical uh, um, action page. Um, so, um, so More Onion actually designed last year our new landing pages for us, which, is, um, which, which performed really well. And, but one other thing our, our, um, our fundraisers were really keen on was having, particularly targeted at new people, is having as many form fields in there as possible to capture as much data. So full name, full address, ideally even phone number as well. And so that's obviously great in some respects that you can capture that all, all that data initially, but it's going to massively reduce the number of people who are going to go on um, and potentially take that campaign action. But one of the things we did um, to try and encourage as many people on our existing email list to carry on and take uh, follow-up actions after their first action was to really streamline that and to make it as simple and, and short a form as possible. So just the absolute minimal amount of data needed. And th these pages we only sent uh, to, to existing supporters in this case. Um, but to try and maximize the, the conversion rates possible. Um, and this one particularly, converted, we had 85% of the people who were sent this form um, and landed on the page then went on to fill, fill that in by keeping it really simple and really short and really to the point. Um, and that encouraged as many of the people that we then recruited to go on and take that second action or third action as, as the case may be. Um, the fourth thing was giving people lots of opportunities to make their first donation, but without pissing them off too much so that they unsubscribed. Um, and there were three main ways that we did this. So the first was, as I mentioned earlier, straight after taking an action online, people went straight through to, to a donation form. Then we did some crowdfunding style asks and we did really specific and tailored versions of our financial appeals. And I'll talk a little bit more about each of those three individually. So um, when someone did a campaign action, they get taken through to a thank you page. And that thank you page would be pre-filled with their name and address and email address data from taking the action initially. And when we started doing that, uh, looked at the data, and before we did that, we had, after someone took a campaign action, we had roughly 0.8% of people then went on to make a donation. After we were able to, to use these kind of pre-filled donation forms, that jumped to 2.4% of people. And that stayed consistent throughout the whole of last year. So that was a trebling of the conversion rate of people going on to donate after taking an action. And that, as like I say, that stayed consistent. It's not a particular campaign. It's purely down to not putting people off, putting barriers in place from people who want to donate. Um, the second thing was sort of crowdfunding style asks. So this was a very recent one we did. Um, and ask, trying to get lots of people. We only ever sent these to people who never made a donation to WDM before. Um, and just asked for a really low amount, in this case, three pounds, to contribute to this really, really specific thing. So this was a stunt to launch uh, a new campaign. And we, we put a bit of an incentive in there to encourage people to uh, give a bit more. So in this case, we were producing a video about the launch of the campaign, and anyone who donated more than 20 quid would get their name in the credits, which is kind of, I think other people have done that similar kind of thing. We ended up with about 30 or 40 people giving 20 quid. These are people who've never, ever given us money before, and we ended up with 1,250 pounds in total, um, from all from people who'd never, ever given us some money before. So making it really low value amounts and really targeting that to the people. So this was around the food campaign. So we sent this to people who'd taken actions on our on our previous food campaign who had, had never made a donation. And so that kind of really, really having that kind of narrative in there and showing the continuity that we're launching a new campaign following on from the previous food campaign. Um, and the last thing was making really tailored versions of financial appeals. So we did five offline and online financial appeals every year. And um, we sent to people who'd never made a donation before, again, we sent a slightly different version of those appeals, again, asking for a really low value amount, in this case, again, three pounds, to really encourage as many of those people to make that, that very first donation that they've never made before. And in this case, this is our Christmas one, again, we had 154 people donate to that appeal who'd never made a donation to WDN before, just by making it really, really simple. Previously, we always used to be a standard 20 pounds uh, was what we'd ask people to to uh, it would, be, it would be the suggested donation amount. But we actually tested asking 20 pounds, 10 pounds, five pounds and three pounds. And the results of that testing were really interesting. So when we asked people to donate 10 pounds, we had a lot fewer donations, something like 20% of the same number of donations when we asked for three pounds. And everybody, literally everybody donated that exact 10 pound 
uh, amount, no, no variety from it at all. When we asked people for five pounds, we had roughly the same number of donations as people who donated uh, uh, from 10 pounds, but the average donation was seven pounds 50. When we asked people for three pounds, we had a huge increase in the number of donations, and the average donation was eight pounds. So, <laughs> Uh, so we stuck with three pounds as the option, and we we send we we uh, um, we we twenty pounds is what we send by default to people who've previous donors. So if someone donates three pounds the first time, the follow up any follow up donation asks they get related to our appeals will be twenty pounds. But um, but the first ask is always always three pounds. Um, it seems to seems to work best, or at least with with WDM's donors. Um, number five and the last one, possibly the most controversial one getting campaigns and fundraising to collaborate. Um, I don't know what people's experience of campaigns and fundraising collaboration internally is in different organizations. I think it's fair to say that at WDM, it wasn't always uh, a case of people seeing eye to eye. Um, I think, to give you an example, I think we had um, quite often the case where campaigners would always be complaining they were, they were really overworked but really desperate for some extra capacity, really desperate to do more campaign actions actually that would really help win the campaigns or contribute to their campaigns but no capacity to deliver those extra actions. And we had fundraisers who were desperate for more content, desperate for more stuff to send to supporters, desperate for more interesting actions, desperate for more variety of emails to send to their supporters. Kind of a bit of an absurd situation. <laughs> and that uh, situation certainly that would be going on at WDM for a very long time. And this kind of opportunity to get fundraisers and campaigners working more collaboratively together on a project like this proved to be really effective <coughs> because what we ended up with was a scenario where uh, fundraisers for example, were helping to write copy to uh, supporters that previously campaigners would have tended to do. We had a scenario where fundraisers were helping to work on email segmentation. And, um, <laughs> and we had a scenario where, um, so campaigners and fundraisers would really look together and sit down at what is the kind of uh, next steps that we'd like people to do that will actually help contribute to the campaign and to contribute to the overall organization-wide objectives around raising money as well. So, and that, for example, was where some of these crowdfunding asks became really valuable, actually, because we were able to do some things as an organization with our campaigns that we otherwise wouldn't have had the funding uh, and the money coming in to be able to do. But it also meant that we were able to send a much greater range of online campaign actions to our supporters by having that kind of organizational wide view of actually campaigning and fundraising really do work, do need to work together to actually deliver this stuff. And the, the end result is that it ended up working pretty effectively for both campaigns and fundraising. So we ended up with more of a tag team of campaigns and fundraising working together to save the world, maybe something like that. So the five key things, just to, just to finish up. So segmenting all our comms. Email, really vital. Having a series of online actions, a bit of a narrative. Loads of opportunities for people to make first donation and campaigns and fundraising collaborating effectively together. Mm -hmm.